Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I just wanted to wrap up talking about chapter one associated with our introduction to statistics uh, by wrapping up and talking about just a couple of additional issues that I wanted to discuss in regards to scale of measurements uh, and also in terms of some very interesting topics that were covered in your textbook in regards to what were called constructs and also operational definitions. Uh, so when we are going to start today by talking about this issue of constructs versus operational definitions for a very important reason. Uh, whenever it is that we think about um, this aspect of uh, operational definitions and constructs, there's a very important relationship that we have to think of whenever it is that we're dealing with um, the aspect of statistics. So when you guys think of a construct, um, what is a construct? The way that we define a construct is an abstract idea that we're working with. Uh, so when you think of something, uh, think of something, right? So if someone says to you, hey, I passed, um, the first thing that runs through, kind of through your mind is, well, they must have received anything greater than a 70 or above, because normally that's the definition that we all use for that idea of passing, right? Uh, but that's not always the, ca the case. So for instance, if you guys think about university classes, uh, technically a, a D, so getting a 60 or greater is technically passing in classes. But for other individuals, they may say, well, that's not really passing. You got a D, so you really didn't pass the class, but you were able to continue on to the next class, for instance. So here, the idea of a construct is the abstract idea that we're working with, right? So the term passing, uh, or even think in psychology, the way that we use it, when we say something like aggression. Well, what does aggression mean? Uh, what does self-esteem mean? What does success mean? Uh, what does personality mean? Um, what is anything really that we're talking about? Memory, uh, what is comprehension, all of those things. We already have a general idea as to what is it all those things are because we all s speak the very similar language in terms of psychology, right? We all speak that rhetoric um, in terms of those basic terms, but not everyone is going to understand it. So if you walk up to a random stranger on the street and you tell them, well, you know, when you're evaluating someone's self-esteem levels, this is the way that we're going to evaluate those self-esteem levels. And the person may say, well, what is self-esteem? I really don't understand what that means. So for us in psychology, we all have this general idea as to what self-esteem means because we all already have that general definition. But for others, they may not. So you may have to actually express that definition. And what is that definition called for us in psychology or psychological research? That's what we call our operational definition. The operational definition is essentially the way that we're going to define our term. And that's going to be very, very important for us. So in terms of the way that we're going to define our term or our construct, we're going to now be very, very precise. So for instance, if you say something to the degree of uh, passing a class is getting anything from a 60 or above, then now anything that you get, so it can be a 60, it can be a 70, it can be an 80, a 90, a 99, or even a 100. Here, that's all going to be passing for that individual because we're all accepting that definition. Uh, aggression, for instance, if you say, well, aggression is going to be um, kicking, slapping, punching, uh, you know, shooting, stabbing, etc. All those terms are going to be aggression. That's perfect. But what happens in the case where you do something like the following? Let's say that one of your participants says something like, well, I really don't like that person for the following reason. Well, is that going to be considered aggression? Probably, right? So especially because it's a negative comment, right? So we would all say, yeah, that's definitely aggression. But if you didn't put it into your operational definition, technically it doesn't count. And for us as researchers, especially when we're doing something like statistics, it's very, very important for us to actually be able to use the right operational definitions and have those operational definitions be as precise as possible. Because if not, there is going to be misunderstanding and also in terms of data collection, so in terms of actually gathering the data that we're going to be talking about the semester with statistics, Sometimes we may have mistakes because we didn't actually collect the data when in reality we were supposed to. Or data was collected when in reality it wasn't supposed to either. So it can go both ways. So in one instance, well, yeah, you would say to yourself, of course somebody saying a negative comment would constitute aggression. Well, what if you were only talking about physical aggression? So now let's say that one of your uh, research assistants actually says, well, that person made a negative comment about Becky. Well, then that's aggression. But in reality, you as a researcher only wanted them to write down physical aggression acts, not verbal aggression acts. So now in your physical aggression acts, you now have verbal aggression acts also included in that one particular score. So now your score is not really representative of physical aggression, but rather it's representative of a mixture of physical aggression and verbal aggression when you only wanted physical. 
So it's very, very important for us that whenever it is that we're dealing with this issue of constructs and operational definitions, we understand, number one, what the construct is that we're working with, and number two, define it precisely. If you don't have the precise definition, so in other words, having an exact operational definition, it makes it virtually impossible for you to have the right construct that you're going to end up measuring at a later point in time. And we're going to get to that point a little bit later on the semester when we talk about the aspect of validity. So the last thing I want to talk to you guys about today in, in terms of this lecture is the idea of scales of measurement. Um, this is very, very important for us because in statistics, there's really four scales of measurement that we deal with. There's what we call nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio scales of measurement. So again, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio scales of measurement. Now, the first one here that I'll present to you is what we call nominal uh, scales or nominal scales of measurement. Um, nominal scales of measurement essentially... And here, by this issue, whenever it is that we're talking about scales of measurement here, and we're talking about statistics, uh, we're always talking about quantitative data, okay? So in other words, we're talking about numerical forms, okay? We're very rarely, if ever, going to be dealing with qualitative data, as we discussed in our previous lecture, so the aspect of, of narratives uh, or verbal responses, but rather we're really going to be dealing with numbers. So in terms of these numbers that we're going to be collecting, the first ones that we can sometimes collect is what we call nominal scales or nominal uh, scales of measurement. So here, whenever it is that you're dealing with nominal scales, essentially are not nominal numbers, essentially here we have classification of responses into specific categories. So let's say, for instance, um, that we're doing a research study on males versus females, on whatever the case may be, right? So participant number one comes in and they see that they're a male. So normally what they're going to do is they're going to respond by saying, I am male. So they're actually going to give you a narrative response. So now to actually convert that into a statistical response that we're actually going to want to work with, statistically speaking, I now need to convert that from being qualitative to being quantitative in nature. So to do that conversion, normally what I'm going to do is anything that is narrative or verbal in response, I'm going to put that into actual categories. And we're going to talk about some statistical procedures on how to do that later on. But the easiest way for us just to say is, well, males are going to be classified as a one, females are going to be classified as a two. Now, very important here. The numbers actually don't mean anything above what their categories represent. So it's very, very important. So don't think that because males are number one, that means that males came first or males are better or males are smarter or whatever. That does not mean that at all. It just means that you gave that category, male, the first value and that value was a one. Females, a value of a two. Now here, you can pick any values that you want to represent those categories. So for instance, you can pick a category for males equaling 98 and females a category of a 22 and it really wouldn't matter. So the only thing that actually matters for us is that those numbers, that 22 and a 98, correspond to the female and to the male category and that's it. So very important here, the numbers just represent categories, that's a nominal aspect. So here we're looking at the names aspect, right? So the nominal with an N, looking at the name, right? So the category name here that we're working with. Uh, other examples that you may want to think of, your ID number, for instance, or your social security number that you're working with. Um, my ID number, for instance, is 454289. What does that mean for me? All it means is that that is my number. So that number represents my category, right? So that represents everything about me. So anytime that number pops up, it's in reference to me. Now, does that mean I came before other people? Does that mean that I'm older than other individuals? Does it mean I'm smarter or anything like that? No, because there are other people who have social security or sorry, uh, ID numbers at the university whose ID numbers are you know, lower than mine. Somebody may have a 13, 14, 19 uh, ID number. That doesn't mean anything in reality except for it's just the person that it corresponds to. The second scale of measurement here that I want to introduce is the aspect of an ordinal scale of measurement. So now, a little bit different from our nominal scale, here we're still dealing with numbers, right? So here you're still going to be dealing with a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, and a 5, or whatever the case may be. But here now, those numbers represent now rankings, and that's very, very important for us. So now, here we actually have differences in terms of the numbers that we're representing, and there's a little bit more than just categories. So here, let's say for instance that we're looking at a, a value of a 1 and a value of a 2. Here we're going to have a rank order, so a 1 comes before a 2, we know that. But do we know distance or magnitude differences between the 1 and a 2? And the answer is no, we actually don't know that. All that we know is that 1 comes prior to 2, 2 comes before 3, 3 comes before 4, etc, etc, etc. Now, just as with our nominal scales of measurement, here um, with nominal, remember, our values just represent the categories. Here for ordinal, 
the numbers really correspond to this aspect of a rank. So in other words, Joe, for instance, is ranked number one in class while Fred is ranked number two. Now, do we know how much better Joe or Jose is than Fred or what his score is in comparison to Fred? And the answer is no. So for instance, Jose may have a 99 as an average for the class while Fred may have a 98.9. So technically, Jose still has a higher grade or higher rank than does Fred in this particular case. That's why he's ranked number one and Fred is ranked number two. So again, the differences between those numbers don't mean anything. What really matters to us is which one comes before the other. So um, also think about the Olympics, for instance. Um, gold, silver, and bronze, we always know that one, two, and three, right? So gold is one, silver is two, and bronze is three. But normally here, you don't really know the differences in terms of those numbers between one, two, and three. So the difference between one and two could have been five milliseconds, but the difference between two and three may have been eight seconds. So here, is that really fair for us to then say, well, it's going to be a one and two and a three. It really should have been a, uh, you know, a one, a two and, a, and an eight, for instance, right? Because it, it was so much further than the difference between a one and a two. But we really can't make that kind of assertion at this point. The only differences that we can say is that there's a difference between a one and a two, that a one comes before a two, and that's really about it. I don't really know anything in terms of the differences between uh, those two numbers except the rank order. The third scale of measurement here that I want to introduce is interval scales of measurement. Now here, aside from just having order, uh, we also do have representation of quantity and equal units between our numbers. Now, a very interesting aspect associated with our interval scales of measurement. Uh, here, we do have a zero value that sometimes is presented to us in an interval scale, but that doesn't actually have a true representation of a zero. Now, what does a true representation of a zero mean for us? Well, that's really where a ratio scale comes into, uh, comes into play, where we actually have a true zero point being represented. And a zero for us in uh, statistics, for instance, when, whenever it is that we're going to be using a ratio scale of measurement, it really means that there's an absence or an absolute absence of an attribute that we're, that we're actually measuring. So if we think about an interval scale, uh, think about, for instance, GPAs. GPAs can range from a zero to a four, right? Uh, so what does the GPA of a zero mean? So even in a class, for instance, you can get zero GPA points out of a class if you end up getting an F. Now, does that mean then that you learn nothing in the entire course? So you know zero pieces of information, you have zero knowledge associated with that specific topic? No, it doesn't, right? So in other words, that zero doesn't really represent that there's an absolute absence of an attribute associated with material that you acquired in the course, but rather it just wasn't enough for you to actually have any points associated in terms of your score, right? So you didn't perform well enough, so you didn't get anything greater than a 60 or above in terms of your score, so that, that way you can then have uh, a value greater than a zero in that specific aspect. Um, also think about uh, questionnaires. Questionnaires do this a lot, that they'll put in sometimes a zero value, uh, which is really weird. So for instance, uh, rate your self-esteem from a zero to a three or from a zero to a seven. Well, if you write a zero in for self-esteem, does that really mean then that you lack self-esteem? You have zero self-esteem? And the answer is no. You can never have zero self-esteem. You can have very, 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 very low self-esteem, but you can never have zero self-esteem. Uh, and that's a very, very important aspect for us. Uh, other examples, for instance, are Fahrenheit scale. Uh, Fahrenheit has a zero value, but what does the zero value represent for us uh, in terms uh, of a Fahrenheit scale? It's not where water freezes at 32 degrees, so what does a zero mean? It'd be cold, right? But it doesn't actually represent where water is actually freezing for us. Um, but for instance, if you look at a Celsius scale, on a Celsius scale, the zero does truly represent a zero in terms of an absence of molecular movement associated with water molecules. So thus, that zero for a Celsius scale is a true zero, right? Uh, now, if we actually look at the zero uh, aspect, right, with associated with our zero scales, um, think about, for instance, number of errors on a task or your weight or your time or your height. Uh, so for instance, if you get zero errors on an exam, you get 100% on the exam, it essentially means that you did not make any mistakes at all to deviate from getting 100%. Or for instance, you didn't get any errors in terms of your driving performance, right? So you were driving and you didn't deviate from a line. You just stayed straight on that line, perfect, you get 100, you get zero errors, perfect errors at all. Uh, if you have uh, zero weight, you don't have any weight at all, right? So you cease to have weight. 
Um, if you have zero height, um, both with weight and height, uh, with weight and height, if you have zero uh, in those two particular instances, you essentially cease to exist, right? Because you should always have a weight and you should always have a height. Um, in terms of time, uh, for instance, if we have zero time, uh, or uh, you have um, zero errors or, or zero deviation in terms of time that you may encounter in certain instances, um, here that can be a true representation of zero. So this is very, very tricky in terms of interval and ratio scales. They both have zeros, but in interval scales, not a true representation of a zero. For ratio scales, we have a true representation of a zero, and that's very, very important for us. Now, that is essentially a summary associated with our introduction of statistics uh, for uh, this week. Uh, please make sure to also do your homework assignment, and remember that your homework assignment is due this Friday by 11.59 p.m. Remember that your homework assignments have to be handwritten they have to be scanned and uploaded uh, through Blackboard SafeAssign. Uh, the links will, uh, are already available for you uh, to submit your homeworks. Uh, under the week two module, there will be a link on there that says homework. The homework will be displayed there and then there'll be an additional link that says submit homework here and you'll just click on that link and then attach your homework assignment to that. Um, that way it'll make it easier for me to be able to grade your work and then send that back to you so you can make any edits that you may need in terms of your homework assignments. Um, I hope that everyone enjoyed the introductory lectures uh, for, these, for this week. Next week, we're going to begin introducing some additional topics. We're going to begin working with uh, actual statistics next week. We're going to begin talking about measures of central tendency and the importance of those measures, uh, their benefits, their limitations, how they're calculated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of things that we're going to talk about this semester. Uh, and so next week will be a lot of fun as well. Uh, if you guys do have any questions, please make sure to let me know. Uh, please feel free to Blackboard IM me or please make sure uh, to, uh, to email me any questions that you may have and also be reading your textbooks. So if you don't have any questions, we will uh, go ahead and reconvene next week with our lectures in which we'll talk about uh, Chapter 2. Have a good rest of your day and please let me know if you have any questions.